views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Bronx Talk. Last spring, tonight's guest defeated a 30-year incumbent, and in November, he was elected to the House of Representatives to represent parts of the Bronx and Westchester in New York's 16th Congressional District. Coming out of the world of education, he was the founder and former principal of the Cornerstone Academy for Social Action, a public middle school in Eastchester, and he's been appointed as the vice chair of the Committee on Education and Labor, and he also serves on the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. Tonight, we have lots to talk about and lots to catch up with Congressman Jamal Bowman. Good evening, Congressman Bowman. So nice to have you back on the program. Good evening, Gary. Good to see you, and it's great to be back. Uh, the first thing I just want to say on behalf of uh, BronxNet Television and all of us, uh, Rebecca and Stephen, who work on the program, uh, condolences and much sympathy to you and your family. I know you lost your mom. And, uh, you know, we talk about politics and everything else. Nothing more important than that. And so we just wanted to extend the uh, best wishes to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it occurred to me, and, and you uh, uh, basically touched on it uh, before we started, that after pulling off an upset that some said could not be done, and then being you know, sworn in as a representative of the House of Representatives, and then a former middle school principal getting the opportunity not only to be on the Committee for Educational Labor, to be elected the vice chair of that committee. This has got to be something that you could never, I mean, for you, a dream come true. Uh, I, I don't even know how you could get your arms around what this means. No, it's a, it's a tremendous honor. And, and you're right. Not something I even thought about, still kind of wrapping my head around it. And, and you know, I, I'm just a, you know, young man born and raised in East Harlem, Upper East Side, Manhattan, raised by a single mom, lived in public housing, uh, used to get in trouble in public school as a kid. And, um, you know, I worked in public education for 20 years as a, as a teacher, guidance counselor and middle school principal. And then to be one, to be crazy enough to run for for. <laughs> two to win, three to get on a committee that I obviously wanted to be a part of, and then four to be elected as, as its vice chair. It, it's kind of it's kind of surreal, um, but it's incredibly humbling. I'm also on the um, Science, Space, and Technology Committee, and I'm chair of the subcommittee on energy on that committee. So it's just an incredible honor and obviously a lot of work to do. You talked about your humble beginnings. I guess um, this is this is what America is about. And uh, so let's get to work. Uh, when you were sworn in, you called in, uh, you called uh, for a new deal in public education. What does that mean to you? And um, where, where are we at in trying to even implement it in this very, very um, uh, politically fraught uh, uh, Congress right now? So as we deal with the worst pandemic of the last 100, 100 years, uh, this is an opportunity for us to reimagine, rethink and redesign our public schools and how we engage with our kids and our families and our communities. Um, we, we hit the ground running with that, so to speak, with, uh, with the American Rescue Plan, uh, bringing in over $8 billion into public schools in in New York State and over 130 billion into public schools, K to 12 public schools across the country. Um, so the money is just the beginning. With those resources and hopefully more resources to come, we'll begin to do things like lower class size, bring music and the arts back into our schools, bring sports and athletics back into our schools, teach from a holistic perspective, meaning as opposed to a curriculum that's isolated uh, into classes and courses, 
make sure they're interdisciplinary, collaborative, and cooperative, and really truly prepare our kids for the challenges of a 21st century economy like climate change, poverty, racial justice, and other uh, important issues. Maybe you could connect for me and for our viewers, what role does a legislature play in that? I, I, I will tell you personally, my parents were both educators and I understand you know, a, a proper curriculum and an improper curriculum and the emphasis on testing and certainly the, um, the financial um, uh, incentive that uh, testing companies have had, have had great influence on education. How can the legislature, I mean, I understand putting money toward things, we get that, smaller class sizes, but how can um, a legislature, a, a legislator in the House of Representatives actually affect what goes on in a classroom? Well, Congress often sets the agenda for what happens locally, not just when it comes to education, but law enforcement and many other areas. So it's our job to set the mission and vision uh, and the framework for how our public schools should operate locally. Um, no Child Left Behind, a federal policy that came in 2001, has pretty much dictated what has happened in our public schools over the last uh, 20 years. Um, so that's one. Two, you know, you talk about testing. Testing was a big part of No Child Left Behind, and it, it incentivized manu annual testing uh, in grades three through eight and once in high school over the last 20 years. So what we can do in Congress is to incentivize uh, going in a different direction, a direction that's more child-centered, a direction that's more research-based, and again, a direction that deals with the demands of a 21st century economy. And, and, it, and we can work in collaboration with states and local school districts to get a better understanding of what's happening on the ground so that we can provide the, the technical and financial supports uh, from a congressional standpoint. So, uh, you know, it's been done over the last 20 years. It got us here. But now as we pivot and go in a new, new direction, the federal government has to play a big part of that. I think there's no doubt that um, we're going to need a different look at schools. Children have just had an absolutely horrible time over the past 12 or 14 months. I don't think there's any doubt of, about that. And to just put them in there and open the books and say, OK, now learn your math. It's just not going to work. But I'm, going, I'm preaching to the choir here. If you put a, a conga drum in a kid's hand or if you put a pen and, and, and paper and, or, or crayons or paint in a child, Child's hands, and I'm thinking of Bronx kids who always got something to say. You know, they're just going to do better when it comes to that other stuff. And again, I know I'm preaching to the choir, well, well, but we got to do this. Yeah. To that, to that point, we have to tap into the curiosity and the cre creativity that's innate in all of our kids. Right to your point, the highest level of any education is the ability to apply what you learn. So when we talk about music, when we talk about the arts, when we talk about theater, when we talk about sports, and when we talk about true project-based curriculum in our schools and ask kids to build and create and design, they're much more excited about learning. And that is the environment in which they thrive. And we haven't approached uh, education in that way over the last 20 years. And now is the time, especially after COVID, for us to welcome our kids into an environment like that and set them up for long-term success. You know, I uh, once did an uh, interview, this goes back, it's gotta be 20 years with the um, uh, head of the PSAL. And he told me right now, I got 26,000 kids who play sports. And in order to play, even practice, they have to attend school. If you double my budget, I'll get you 52,000 kids. And, th and that's really what we're talking about. Um, I wanna ask you about um, the first lady is an educator. Uh, the president um, appointed, um, uh, or, and he was uh, he selected uh, Miguel Cardona as education secretary, who was recently approved. Um, what do you expect to see from the secretary? Were you pleased with that? I, I know you had uh, made some recommendations that weren't followed, uh, but you are a freshman, let's be fair. Um, but what do you think about um, Secretary Cardona right now, and what do you expect to see from him? Well, I'm happy that he's an educator. You know, he's someone who's been a teacher. He's been a school administrator. He's been a district administrator, and he's been a state administrator. So that's a good thing. He has been an educator. And throughout his career, he's implemented 
uh, things like a more multicultural curriculum in high schools, for example, that I think we need to do on a national level. We disagree in terms of his decision to implement standardized tests this year, despite being in the middle of a global pandemic. So I disagree with him on that issue. I think he should be providing waivers uh, to, uh, to states and school districts because kids are just coming back. We're just reopening. Uh, but I'm more optimistic than pessimistic. And I look forward to working with him and pushing him and the country to look at education in the way that we've been discussing so far. So, you know, much better than Betsy DeVos, but I do want to say that Betsy DeVos allowed states to get waivers last year, and now she's not there and we don't have waivers. So that, that doesn't align with what we're supposed to be as the Democratic Party. Uh, talking about uh, politics, one of the things that seems to bind both parties is the notion of getting kids back to school. Everybody wants to get them back to school. I was looking at um, comparing in school versus the general public. Um, overall, infections uh, range from, um, uh, you know, 51 to 68 percent less. So, you know, the infections, some are even doubting whether it was necessary to close the schools in the beginning. To me, the one X factor are teachers, completely sympathetic to teachers who say, wait a minute, you're not going to put us at risk. Um, what do we need to do to make everybody safe and get our schools functioning again? So the X factor is teachers and the X factor is also community spread. Um, and New York City presents its own X factor as well because of the density of the city and how people travel uh, to and from school. You know, kids are traveling via bus, via train, and in a variety of ways to get to and from school. So we have to be careful there. Um, we need PPEs, obviously. We need testing and contact tracing in place. That's robust. And we need to grow and make vaccines available for everyone. Uh, President Biden is looking at May 1st as a date uh, of making vaccines available for everyone. That's going to be helpful. So high school kids and their teachers can be vaccinated as well as parents. And I'm looking towards a full opening of school uh, by September. I think if we try to rush it and bring every kid back in May or June, uh, that's going to be that's not going to be the right thing to do. I mean, again, New York City schools are overcrowded. So do we really are we really ready to have 30 kids in a classroom after coming off a pandemic? I don't think we are. So we have to be a lot more careful there, especially in areas with high community spread. There's a, a big movement towards school choice, and um, I know you support the notion of school choice, but there's a battle between um, the public schools and the charter schools over space right now. And now that we're going to need more space, um, do you have a, a thought on that? Is that an individual negotiated thing for each item, or do you have a, a general look at what should happen? Yeah, so just to clarify, uh, I, I don't support the notion of school choice when we're talking about charter schools. If a parent wants to choose a different public school, they should have a right to choose that different public school. But the charter school lobby and voucher programs and the private investments and, and the deregulation and all those things that go into charter schools uh, is not something I support. But obviously parents can, 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 do, uh, what, can choose to do whatever they wanna do is their choice in terms of where they wanna place their kids. We need to fully invest in our public schools. And what's happened over the last 20 years is money has been taken from public schools, given to charter schools, space has been taken from public schools and given to charter schools, and our public schools haven't had the full support. So I'm hoping to continue to fight for the full support of public schools in Washington, because public schools are designed and have been meeting the needs of every child, whereas charter schools have not done the same thing. Uh, one more education question, then we'll talk about uh, uh, some other things. What about the student loan forgiveness? There's, uh, uh, I mean, many people, and frankly, including me, would really be happy to see that. But there's a lot of talk that, you know what, you're going to forgive loans for people maybe who can afford to pay and that maybe, um, you know, that 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 resource is not being applied properly. Your thoughts on um, the level of student loan forgiveness? So I support forgiving student, student loans completely. Uh, many of us acquire student loans because of predatory lenders, uh, and we didn't have the knowledge during that time to really navigate that space. 
In addition, many people acquire student loans within an economy that wasn't really providing good jobs and providing good salaries. So many of us, after accumulating 10, 20, 50, $100,000 in debt, uh, were underemployed um, after college. So this is a chance to reset our economy. If we forgive student loans, in their ongoing uh, learning and development. Uh, it was during a predatory time. As a matter of fact, over the last 50 years, we've seen predatory behavior from Wall Street uh, as well as lenders. And this is a chance, just like in education, to reset our economy. I got to tell you, the federal student loan that comes out of the federal government that I have is a predatory loan. <laughs> I wish I had another way of saying it, but after I really evaluated it over the course of time, I said, you know, I paid so much and it hasn't dropped the dropped the uh, balance down. And I said, you know what? And I called up and I said, you know, you, you're running a predatory loan. So that obviously has got to change one way or the other. Okay. Um, let's just talk about some other things in Washington, D.C. You took uh, office at, at uh, one of the most incredible times. Where were you on January 6th? I know you put out a report that said you were safe and well. Um, you called for the uh, expulsion of Republican members of Congress um, who might have incited the attack. So let's start with where you were, and then let's talk about the fallout. Yes, yeah, so I was in my office, which is right across the street from the Capitol. Um, and thank God I was here because I had maybe 100 colleagues who were in the Capitol during this time. I couldn't even imagine what they were going through. And yeah, you know, we were watching the proceedings, you know, in a, on, on the television. And all of a sudden, we hear this chaos through the TV going on in the back. And then when I turn to CNN, I see people literally scaling the walls of the Capitol. And it immediately made me think of the War of 1812. Um, but we were here. We were safe. Um, no one uh, drew their, we didn't draw their attention over here in, in, in our office, which was great. And um, we huddled that evening to kind of reflect on what the heck just happened. Thankfully, members of Congress were OK, and it gave us the opportunity to draft our first piece of legislation, which was the Coup Act, Cong Congressional Oversight of Unjust Policing Act, which we introduced. That was a, a Wednesday. We introduced it the following Monday, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what about the idea of um, Republicans being expelled? You know, there's been a lot of all of a sudden it's off the news. It's 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 not it doesn't seem to be on the table anymore. Uh, Republicans have dug in their heels about it. Is that going anywhere at this point or is it pretty much off the table? So not at this point, I wouldn't say it's off the table, um, but not at this point. There's there's not much movement there. But there is movement around my idea of a 9-11 style commission to investigate exactly what happened. Uh, Speaker Pelosi, Pelosi picked up the idea and hopefully we'll be voting on it soon. Not this week because we're dealing with um, voting on immigration bills and, and other things. But that's something that has a lot of energy and a lot of excitement. So it might be an opportunity for one of my first ideas to actually be be uh, be passed as a as a bill in Congress. Oh, we'll have you back, and you could talk about it when that happens. Um, when you defeated uh, Congressman Engel, it was a, really another step in in kind of a changing vision for the Democratic Party. Um, how badly fractured is the party right now? What's the, what's the community like? I'm going to ask you two questions about it. Yeah. Number one, within the Democratic Party, and then it it seem, would be interesting to know if you have as a freshman relationship with any Republican Congress members. Yeah, I, I don't feel any kind of fracture, uh, quite honestly. You know, I, I'm a progressive. I'm a member of the Congressional uh, Progressive Caucus, and I have good relationships with, with members of throughout the caucus. I have a good relationship with Speaker Pelosi, uh, with, with Biden's office, with um, Majority Leader uh, Hoyer, with Majority Whip Clyburn. Um, so I don't, I don't feel any, any sort of fracture. Uh, it's been pretty collaborative. Um, so far, and and no uh, deep relationships with Republicans yet. However, there is some bipartisan cooperation, particularly on the Science and Tech Committee. Uh, I recently introduced uh, my first amendment on that committee, and, and it had bipartisan support, and it passed unanimously on on the Energy Subcommittee. So um, that's that's pretty exciting uh, that that was able that was able to happen. 
And um, we'll see how it is going forward because we still have, you know, so many issues happening with Republicans, particularly in the Senate. You know, when we look at the filibuster, the fight for a $15 minimum wage, um, you know, HR1, HR4, the Voting Rights Act. So, so we'll see what happens there. But um, I, I don't see a huge fracture, at least not on the House side. Uh, you know, when you talk about that, uh, you know, and, and the whole notion, because, of course, the, the media, uh, you can blame us, you know, for b- b- putting it out there. But there has got to be some common ground between as far progressive as you might be with Republicans. I mean, you know, there are tornadoes ripping through the central uh, of America. You you have got to know <laughs> that this is a result of climate change after Texas got its worst snowstorm in history that literally destroyed its, um, you know, energy delivery. Um, there's got to be common ground on some of these issues. Am I, am I wrong about that? You, you're not wrong. I think Republicans think that, um, and I don't want to generalize, but I think many Republicans believe that uh, we, we need private industry to solve our most pressing issues. And we cannot move so rapidly away from our dependence on fossil fuel. Now, we have to understand that many of these Republicans are are funded uh, by private industry. They're funded by the fossil fuel industry and they're funded by Wall Street. So that's why many of them are saying that. But to your point, climate change is real. It's present and at our doorstep. And if we don't invest the, the resources from a congressional perspective, uh, we're going to we're going to be much worse off ten years from now than we currently are, and that's our mission. Our mission is within the next ten years, ten to fifteen years, we get to net zero carbon emissions. Republicans believe it, it needs to happen through private industry and and market ideology. We believe the federal government needs to step in the same way we stepped in during the industrial revolution and the Homestead Act and other other the New Deal. Uh, throughout American history. This needs to be government driven, at least in the very beginning. Uh, there was a lot of uproar and criticism of the Biden administration over the pipeline. And uh, they said, you just cost us, I forget what the number is, you know, tens of thousands of jobs. And the pushback was, well, we can create green jobs. How quick can we create those green jobs to take those places of, of, of those other jobs? Because those people, you know, you say, well, we're going to have it in two or three years. Well, they're, they're living with families and expenses during that time. And they need work. Um, how quick can those conversions happen? As, as quickly as we, as we want them to happen. It's all about our will as elected officials and our will as a Democratic Party uh, to make this happen. We are ready to go green right now. We just have to invest and we have to work with labor to ensure a just transition. So if someone is working in the fossil fuel industry, a just transition involves uh, training for clean, green, renewable jobs, and getting paid during that training at the rate that people are currently being paid. So no loss of salary, no loss of income, no loss of health care. You just will be a part of a transition towards a green, clean, renewable energy sector. Um, so there's no financial loss. Uh, mm-hmm. It's just a transition. And we're ready whenever the White House and the rest of Congress are ready to dive in. You know, I always say to people who are in, in you know, uh, dialogue about it, we just have to want to. If we want to, we can actually do it. Um, I want to talk, spend a few moments um, before we end the program uh, and talk about something that I know is important to you, and that is social justice and social justice issues. Um, uh, can you legislate social justice? Is, is that where we've got to go now to, to force the issue? Of course, what just happened in, in Georgia is just uh, horrific. Uh, the, di- you know, the, the dialogue that over, over uh, Asian people that led to it or apparently led to it. Um, but can it be legislated or is there another something else that has to happen? So, yes, it can be legislated and other things need to happen, right? So, You know, the 13th Amendment was a piece of legislation. So was the 14th and 15th Amendment. Uh, Women's rights was legislated. Uh, The LGBTQ rights was legislated, right? So we need to legislate from the perspective of giving every person an opportunity towards self-determination, regardless of race or class or gender or identity or culture. Uh, And unfortunately, you know, um, misogyny and patriarchy and white supremacy 
is embedded in our policy, both explicitly and implicitly. So yes, it can be legislated. One of the things we're going to introduce um, as a piece of legislation soon is an anti-racist, anti-hate, anti-xenophobic uh, curriculum that we'll implement in our schools. Because I think personally, the more we live together, go to school together, learn about each other, the more we realize that we are more the same than we are different, and the more we can exist and create a better world together. Unfortunately, uh, Donald Trump and others like him who follow him uh, don't have those same beliefs. So they've created an environment where now our Asian uh, family and friends are being are being attacked. And, and, and you and I, who are, I believe you're born and raised in New York. I'm born and raised in New York. I'm a Bronx boy through yeah. and through. We, we live amongst each other. We live with everyone and we learn so much from each other and we love each other as a result. And I believe that that absolutely can be legislated. I know people talk accountability on the back end and it obviously should be accountability if you're anti-Semitic or racist or anti-Asian or what have you. But on the front end, we need to be proactive and preventative with policy and education and how we engage with each other. Uh, I've said it numerous times. You can't live in the Bronx and not like people of other ethnicities. It's just not possible. If I walk out of my apartment and look at the people who live in the five other apartments, I think we're all from different parts of the world. So, and if you if you don't like them, where are you going to go? <laughs> you know, what deli are you going to shop in? You know. Um, just a couple of local things. Um, are you content to wait on the results of an investigation on Governor Cuomo, or do you think he ought to step down right now? Well, I called for um, his resignation, I believe, about a week ago, uh, myself, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez, and uh, the delegation, um, just because when you combine what's happening with uh, what happened with the nursing home um, a situation where, you know, we weren't told the truth about that. Um, in addition to the accusations of uh, assault and, um, and, uh, and, and maltreatment, um, I believe it's time for him to, to step down um, because it's just, you know, we, the, the, the public has to have faith in our ability to govern. And I think a lot of that faith has been compromised at this point. I think an investigation should go forward um, from a criminal perspective, some of this stuff, some of these accusations are, are potential criminal charges. So an investigation should absolutely go forward to see if it gets to that point. But at this point, you know, as I said in my statement a week ago, I believe uh, he should consider stepping down. Maybe that's a partial answer to my question. Can, uh, you know, social justice be legislated or, <laughs> or not? Here's a case where it wouldn't be legislation, but maybe there's an, another way to look at it. Final question, sir. Um, did you have a, a favorite uh, in mayor? Are you supporting anybody for mayor just yet? Oh, yeah. I endorsed uh, Scott Stringer uh, pretty early in the race. Um, Scott is a native New Yorker has dedicated his entire life to, to, to help in New York City. Um, he's the most progressive in the race, and um, I support him, and I came out pretty early in supporting him. Yes. And you're staying right with it. Congressman, I can't thank you enough. I know you're busy as can be, and you took the time out to be with us and report to um, the Bronx Net Television and your constituents. And um, you're a freshman. It's your first time on after being elected. We hope it's the first of many, many times when you're going to uh, have dialogue about the issues that are important to us here in the Bronx. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Gary. Good to see you. Always a pleasure. Uh, folks, um, we um, uh, will be back next week with more. We'll be back here for Bronx Talk. We thank our producers, Rebe Rebecca Hemick and Stephen Powell. And uh, next week, we're going to talk about mental health services and how they get delivered uh, in the Bronx and the city of New York, especially during this pandemic, when people are um, quite um, having quite uh, uh, serious difficulties just getting along. And uh, on and on. The week after, we'll talk about housing and we'll do more. Uh, thanks so much, and we'll see you then. Good night.